It's already been said, but man, it's so good to see you guys in church today at Cultivate Church. It's my favorite day of the week, and I have been so excited about this morning to come. We've been in a series all month long. If it's your first week with us, we've been in a series called Unstuck. And the big idea simply has been that we want to get ourselves unstuck. Have you ever just felt like you were in a rut? You felt like if I have to do this one more day, I'm just going to I'm going to leave the planet. I'm going to pack all my bags. I mean, you've said that before. I'm just packing my bags. I'm leaving all this behind and I'm going to find somewhere to go. Somewhere where it's sunny and warm and nobody knows my name. You know what I'm talking about? We've all been there. You've got places in your life where you've been stuck in marriage, you've been stuck in finances, you've been stuck in your health, you've been stuck in your job. You just feel like you get in a rut. And there's not one person in this building or watching by the internet that has never experienced that in your life. We have all experienced what it means to be stuck. So on your notes in your worship guide today, I want you to grab those out. We've been using one verse of scripture all month long for our foundational verse. Coming out of Psalm 40 verse 2 saying this, He lifted me out of the ditch. He pulled me from deep mud. He stood me on a solid rock to make sure I wouldn't slip. Now, here's the deal. You can come to church. You can hear a message. You can experience worship. All of those things are great. All of those things are good. This is my favorite day of the week. Sunday is just absolutely the best to me. But how many of you know Monday is coming? Tomorrow morning, it will be Monday all over again. Some of you said, where did the weekend go? You know you know how it feels. You can't wait to get to the weekend, and then you blink your eyes, and it's gone. Monday's coming. Tuesday is coming. Wednesday is coming. We need God at work in our life every single day. Because when Monday rolls around, and I feel like I'm starting all over again, when I feel like I'm stuck in that ditch, when I'm deep in that mud, the Bible says that he will lift us out put us on a solid rock, and make sure that we will not slip. And that's what we've been talking about all month long. All of this stuff is good, but Jesus is the glue that holds it all together. It's about Jesus. It's only Jesus that can make a difference in our life. So this month, in the first week, we just talked about getting desperate to be unstuck. Simply that if you are stuck long enough and you get tired of being unstuck, to begin to get yourself out is to get desperate. And we talked about the woman out of Scripture with the issue of blood. If you missed the messages, go back online, download the Cultivate Church app for your smartphone and watch the messages. Uh, we talked about this woman who just decided one day, hey, I've had enough. I've suffered long enough. I'm getting desperate. I'm going to get to Jesus, and I'm going to be healed. And then in week two, Pastor Brandon Dawes talked about getting unstuck from addictions. Uh, last week, he talked about getting our marriages unstuck. It was a great message. And I will just say, if you missed the marriage conference last night, I don't even know what to say. I don't even know if I can say it on Sunday morning in church. I think it's just a Saturday night thing. I mean, really, if you thought it was going to be butterflies and rainbows, you missed a marriage conference. I'm just telling you. It's coming again, and you do not want to miss it. I'm just telling you. Now, today, here's the big idea. I want to talk to you about a very serious subject. I want to talk to you about a subject that I believe every person in this room has experienced to some degree. Now, I will say this, that I believe there are different degrees, different levels. I believe some of you have experienced at a much, much greater, deeper degree than some others, maybe. And what I want to talk to us about this morning is just the topic of depression. Now, when I say depression, some of you go, oh, I'm not depressed. Some of you say, there's nothing wrong with me, and it's exactly what's wrong with you. Some of you have never experienced depression before, and at some time in your life, you probably will. Some of you think about tomorrow morning, and you're already depressed, just talking about Monday rolling around again. Now, I'll tell you this, that I want to say up front that this is a very, very heavy topic. I want you to know that I don't think that anything we're going to do today in the next few moments and what I'm going to tell you is going to, is going to change your life this morning. I don't think you're going to walk out of here uh, leaping out of depression. But I do believe in the process of being unstuck. We told you in week one that you may have to work at being unstuck. That every day when we wake up, we make a decision that today, Jesus, my life belongs to you. I'm going to live for you, and I'm going to do the very best I can today. Now, some days I do really good, and some days I struggle and wish I could do better. But in this topic of depression today, I believe that as we begin this moment to be unstuck in our lives, that God really wants to do something supernaturally to change your life this morning. Now, 
I won't pretend that I know it all about depression. I won't tell you this morning that medicine is not valid. I won't tell you that doctors are not valid or, or going to see counselors. I believe all of that is good. I believe all of these things has its place. If tomorrow something happened to me and you told me that a pill would make me well and solve my problem, I would take that pill and I would say, thank you, Jesus, that you gave someone the wisdom to come up with this medicine. So I believe God uses it all. But I can tell you this, if Jesus is not the foundation of all of these different methods and all of these things, we're missing it all together. Because it is Jesus who changes our life and makes all things brand new. Now, I can tell you this. Some of you have experienced this at a deeper level than myself. But about seven years ago, I experienced what it was like to be depressed. Now, I, I was like maybe some of you in this morning. I didn't know I was depressed. I didn't know something was wrong. But I knew something was wrong with me. I didn't, want, I didn't like people anymore. And I like people. Most of you I like. Now, some of you are still on the fence. I don't know. I'm just kidding. I like most people. And I, I like to be around people. I like to do things. I like to have fun. Generally not. Most of the time, you know, somebody's just going to be in their, in their room with the door closed all the time. But I just hit this moment in my life. I didn't want to be with people. I didn't like anything around me. I didn't like my job. I didn't like my friend. I didn't like anything. And I did have this just overwhelming, just it's like it was a lurking feeling. You just couldn't get rid of it. I didn't know why it was there or, or how to get rid of it. And then I started noticing what, what started piecing all of these puzzles together was on the side of my head, about the size of a quarter, my hair started falling out. It was almost like a perfect circle. It just fell out right on the side of my head. And I didn't know why it was falling out. I didn't have an answer for it. It was just in one spot. And so everybody started making fun of me. You know, it's like, what's going on with your head? Did you get a bad haircut? You know, I didn't have an answer for it. I'll never forget, I was standing in a movie gallery one night. Now, some of you don't know what a movie gallery is. Last week, Pastor Brennan talked about the telephone. Some of you don't have a clue. You used to be stuck to a wall with a cord when you used the telephone, okay? There used to be, you're gonna, this is going to blow some of your minds, but there used to be actual stores that you walked into and they had movies on the walls. And you paid money to take this movie out of a store. You could pick up the box. You could read the box. I mean, it was really amazing. I think one day maybe we'll visit that again. But I was in this store where you paid to rent a movie. And I stood in line, and I'll never forget standing in line like this at the counter. There is a man to my left, and he's staring at the side of my head where that hair is missing. And I can just feel, you know, him burning that, you know, you, get, you know someone's looking at you. And, I, and it, at this point, it just became fun. So I just let him stare for a moment, and then you do one of those quick looks, and they jump, you know. <laughs> so it was kind of fun for a while until Pastor Brandon Dawes, we worked together on staff at the church, and he walked in one day, and he said, hey, he said, I know what your problem is. I thought, you're my problem. Got in my face. Remember, I was depressed. That was my problem. And he had this piece of paper. And he handed me this piece of paper. And it was a picture. And I, I brought this picture for you. And it, it's, it's a zebra who has lost all of his stripes. And this is the exact picture. And it said, I think it's stress. And he had went to eat at a restaurant. Pastor Brandon, you know, you're shocked. He had been to eat at a restaurant. <laughs> This picture was hanging on the wall, and he saw that picture, thought about the hair on the side of my head that had fallen out, brought me this picture, and we started looking it up on the internet, only to learn that stress, that a sign of, of sort of intense stress, can be that your hair will literally fall out of your head. Now, thank God, he at least made it circular and, and kind of in one pattern. It wasn't like crazy or nothing, you know. But at that moment, I realized something's not right in my life. Something's wrong. And it didn't change overnight, but when I became aware that there was something just not right, and as soon as I accepted that there was something not right, that's when God began to do something inside of me. You know, Scripture says if we draw near to God, that God does what? He draws near to us. And so at that moment, when I was able to identify, God, there's something wrong, I need you to help me. That's when God began to draw unto me. And he was my supply of the things that I didn't have. He renewed the joy. He renewed the hope. He renewed the life that was gone from within inside of me. And what I want you to know this morning is that I'm not God's favorite. God loves you as much as he loves me. And anything that's missing in your life, he is your source this morning. 
Anything that you find yourself stuck in, God is the source. No matter what ditch you're in, how deep the mud, God is going to lift us up out of it, put us on a solid rock, and God is going to transform us from the inside out because that's the kind of God that we serve. So this morning, as we go forward in the message, maybe you're here and you've been feeling like, you know what, I just don't want to do this another day. Maybe you're here today and you're thinking, I can't believe that that little preacher up there is talking about this today because I, nobody knows. Nobody knows I've been struggling. Nobody knows I've had these thoughts. But I just want you to know it's just the Holy Spirit that wants to speak to your heart today and he wants to transform you. Some of you are going, I'm on cruise control because I feel okay. But Monday's coming. You don't know what's around the corner. And we want to be prepared for God to do something in our life no matter what comes our way. So let's do this. Let's pray. Let's ask God to speak to us this morning. Can we do that? Father, we love you this morning. Jesus, we celebrate you. Jesus, we just thank you that this morning, God, out of all the places in the world, of all the people, you're in our presence today. You see us and you love us and you're speaking to us. And God, I pray today that you'd open our ears that we hear you speak clearly, God. God, open our mind that we understand what it is that you're saying. And God, open our hearts that we retain it. God, I don't want to just be a hearer of your word. God, but I want to be a doer. God, I want it to change me so that my life can affect others. And Father, in it all, we'll celebrate you, God, because you are the one who gives all the life change. You're the one that matters, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I want to bring something to, to just right to the forefront from the beginning. Some of you uh, may feel guilty this morning because you feel maybe some depression in your life. Maybe you feel down. You get in the slumps, and you don't know why you feel this way. And suddenly, you may feel guilty about it because, because you love Jesus. Haven't you ever heard the statement, I'm too blessed to be depressed? You know, you've seen it on the shirts, the bumper stickers. And, you know, we do real good because we get to church. It's, my God, brother, I'm too blessed to be depressed. Praise God. You know, you get this, like, Christian ease going on you know and so you kind of got it all together because you think that's what the church is supposed to be but I want you to know up front this morning that it's okay to be a Christian and to struggle now here's what I want to show you this morning I want to bring just a couple of examples they're not in your notes they're not on your outline but maybe you just want to write down some of these people I started looking through scripture and I ran across Moses I and mean, have you ever heard of Moses some of you've heard of Moses he's a pretty important guy in the Bible uh, done lots of things but God did some great miracles in the life of Moses now, I noticed that there's a moment in his life where Moses is going through depression. All the people are complaining around him. I mean, Moses is leading all of God's people, been through a whole lot of stuff. And suddenly, Moses is praying to God, hey, God, if this is it, just kill me. Take my life. Now, if that's not a happy prayer. I don't know about you, but that's not a happy prayer, and that's in the Bible. It's one of God's people who God chose, who, a man who loved God that's just saying, hey, I don't want to do this anymore. If this is what it's about, just take me out. Now, I want you to notice that where this happens in the timeline of Scripture, Moses had just seen God part the Red Sea. You remember the story? Maybe you've heard of it. The sea, there was an army chasing God's people. Moses prays. God opens up the sea. They cross on dry land. When the army gets in, God closes it up, swallows up the enemy. A miracle has taken place. When these people were hungry, God dropped food from the sky and fed them. That's pretty impressive, okay? They didn't go to the grocery store. They just said, God, we're hungry, and food fell in their lap. It's amazing, okay? If I had experienced that, you would think, I mean, you would think the world is just, I mean, it's just at your fingertips. I mean, what are we going to get God to do next? He's splitting, you know, rivers and oceans. I mean, he's dropping food from the sky. It's like, tomorrow, God, can we get steak? I mean, you know, I would be like so pumped. But Moses is depressed after one of the most coolest displays of God's power ever. And Moses is depressed. Another guy named Elijah. Maybe you've heard the story of Elijah. He's on top of this mountain that's full of idol worshipers everywhere. I mean, there's people worshiping gods that they created. Except there's one man who's going to stand up against all these people that say, No, all of your gods are false, but we serve the one true God. Story goes, they get into kind of this showdown on the mountain, kind of like Western style, back-to-back, draw-your-guns type deal. Except this was the deal. They're going to put an altar out in the middle of this mountain, and they said, Whosoever God is real, we're going to call on them one by one. The God who is the true God will consume this altar. Nobody's going to touch it. It's going to be the one true God. Story goes, God, all these other people show up all day long. They're calling their gods nothing. Elijah stands up, calls on the name of the Lord. A fire from heaven consumes this altar. One of the most miraculous events ever in the history of Scripture. Absolutely amazing. The very next thing we see, 
Elijah is depressed. He falls into a deep depression. This whole thing about, well, I'm a Christian, so I can't struggle or I can't go through things. I'm supposed to be a Christian, so God, why is this happening to me? Why do I feel this way? All through Scripture, you can see this happen all over the place. Not only in the lives of other people, but just hang with me this morning. I believe Jesus faced depression. I believe Jesus was depressed at times in his life. Pastor Brennan, how could the Son of God be depressed? There's no way. Let me show you some things that I found out in Scripture. Hebrews 4 and 15, it's on the screen for you. Look at this. It says, the high priest of ours understands our weakness. So Jesus understands our weakness. He faced all of the same testings we do, yet he did not sin. See, there's this cool thing about the life of Jesus living on the earth as a man. The cool thing about it is he experienced life like you and I. Jesus had a Monday morning too. He went to work just as you do. I don't believe Jesus enjoyed his work every single day. I believe there's, there were days when the alarm clock went off and Jesus said, not today, and pulled the covers back over his head. Jesus was just like you and I. The Bible says plainly, he experienced everything that you and I experienced. Write down this passage of scripture. I'm just going to give you a reference. Matthew 14 and 13. Matthew 14 and 13. It tells us that Jesus, his good friend, was a man named John the Baptist, who the Bible says was very instrumental in preparing the way for Jesus to come, for the ministry of Jesus to come on this earth. Now, sadly, the, the, the fate of John the Baptist, eventually he was beheaded. That's how he lost his life, for the sake of Jesus. The Bible says in the verse that I gave you that when Jesus heard that his friend, John the Baptist, had lost his life, the Bible says that Jesus got in a boat and withdrew by himself. He didn't say, okay, well, let's go, let's go get in lunch line. He didn't say, well, let's go over here and hang out with the people. Jesus didn't say, disciples, come with me. Jesus said, leave me alone. I'm going to be by myself. I believe Jesus faced times of depression. All throughout Scripture, the Bible says Jesus withdrew and went, went away to pray. I believe that some of those times, not only was Jesus spending time with God, but I believe Jesus was, was going through some things in his own life. Think about it this morning. Church, if you were put on this earth and you knew your purpose was to give your life to death on a cross, to be crucified for the sins of the world, I don't think you would skip around all the time either. I don't know how Jesus did everything he did. It was only by the power of God. Before Jesus was crucified, he was praying in the garden. And the Bible says that as Jesus prayed, the Bible says that his sweat became drops of blood. You know, I'd read that in the Bible for years. You know, there's sometimes the things you don't understand, you just skip on past. You go, okay, and you just skip past it, you know what I mean? I used to skip past that for years until one day it just began to bother me. I said, what, how in the world? I mean, come on, what, what does that really mean? Did it literally become drops of blood? And I just did a little research, and I got real smart and got out the Google. You know what I'm talking about? Get out the Google. I used to make fun of my pastor because he'd say, get out your Google. You know, I just thought that was funny. And I Googled one day, drops of blood, and I looked up what all this was about. And it's actually a medical condition that it actually says that if your body is under extreme amounts of stress, fear, worry, and anxiety, that the capillaries under the skin can burst. And once they burst under the skin, that through the pores, through the sweat glands, that the sweat suddenly becomes blood. It begins to flow through your body. It's very rare, but it does happen. It, it's, it is a, a documented medical condition. So Jesus, at that moment, as he's going, knowing that he's going to the cross, as he's praying to God, the sweat becomes drops of blood because his body is caving under the severe stress, worry, fear, and anxiety that is in his life. Now, Jesus told his disciples, he said, you stay here and pray for me while I go spend time with God. Now, Jesus, I, I love this because Jesus says, hey, guys, can you wake up for five minutes? I need, I'm about to die here, and you're over there napping, okay? I know you're tired, but hey, I'm about to die. Can you just pray for just a few moments? This happens several times. Now, that's not like a, we think of this as Jesus saying, wilt thou please, you know, you know we, we've got this whole, Jesus saying, hey, fellas, dying, five minutes, can you pray, you jerks? You know what I'm saying? 
That's, that's depressed language. You know what I'm talking about? That's depressed language. Jesus faced depression. So this thought to yourself that the enemy's putting on you, that you're too blessed to be depressed, you're a Christian, you're, you're a believer in God, you're, you're saved, and you, you can't have these feelings, the Bible tells us differently. I believe that it's a real issue that the enemy wants to put on your life. Now, here's why it matters this morning. I want to give you what I believe is the process of depression. That if the enemy can get us in this trap, Here's how the enemy will destroy your life. I put it on the screen for you. Maybe you, wanna, maybe you just want to look at it just, just real quick. I, I want to give it to you. The first little step here is worry. The first step that you will, you'll see yourself going through is worry. You'll begin to worry about things and, and it'll just become something that, that itches at you. It'll just be something that it starts off small. Maybe it's your, your, your fear about your job or about you know, your health. Maybe you've got a doctor's report. It'll just start to begin to eat at you. And then from worry, it begins to develop into anxiety. And, and anxiety is, I, I can't sleep. I just can't focus on anything else. It, it becomes something from the back of the mind, and it shifts all the way to the front of your mind. It, it becomes something that you just can't escape. And then it develops into depression. And full-blown depression says, I don't want to be with anybody. I want to be by myself. I don't want to talk. I don't want to open up. I don't want to face it. I just want to shut down and leave everything and everyone alone. Now, here's where it gets dangerous. It moves from depression into suicidal thoughts. See, this is real. This happens. This, this is something that people struggle with. It just becomes a thought process. Because what's happened is, is, is he's gotten in... From the very beginning, from the back of the mind, he's moving forward, and suddenly you're thinking certain thoughts that you never thought you would think. And ultimately, if God doesn't step in and do a miracle in your life, it leads to suicide. So here's what I want to do this morning. I want to break down this little pattern. And I want to give you three things to focus on this morning that I believe... We can, if we can identify where it comes from in our life, the way that it begins to pattern itself, and the way that the enemy wants to attack you, then we can learn how to adjust it. How we can maneuver around the trick of the enemy to try to get us deep into depression. So number one on your outline, I want to give you three uh, effects of depression, okay? Number one on your outline, here's an effect of depression, is depression affects the way you think. Depression affects the way you think. Now, in Psalm 42, I've got it on your outline. I want you to look at this. This is David. And David was, a, the Bible said, a man after God's own heart. But David, all through the Psalms, I mean, you can see where David is up one moment and he's down the next. David faced depression. He struggled with depression greatly in his life. Now, in, in verse 4, listen to what David says. He said, these things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one. With shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Here's what David's saying. I mean, he's, he, in his mind he's saying, I, I, I remember the way I used to be. I remember the way I used to feel. I remember what it was like to go into the presence of God to be in his house. How I used to pour out my soul to him. I remember what it, what it used to be like, who, who I used to be. And in your thinking, in, in your mind, you, you kind of get all this moving here and you're, you're just thinking about the way things used to be and, and now you're comparing it to today and suddenly everything seems worse, it seems bad, it seems overwhelming, it seems like all hope is lost, it seems like you'll never get out of the grave that you feel like you're in, that ditch that you feel like has swallowed you whole, your mind will begin to tell you that all hope is gone, this is as good as it will ever be, those were the good old days. How many of you can remember saying that? I remember the good old days. Well, good, well, here's the truth. Those days were really not that good. I mean, let's be honest. You just feel like they're good because you got a few years separated. You remember that job that you hated, and you said, if I could ever get out of this job, and then you're suddenly going five years later, yeah, that job really wasn't so bad, you know. Some of you are telling your kids, if I could go back to school today, I would. That was the best time of your life. You've told your kids that. That was not the best time of your life. You hated every second of it. You wanted out of school. It just suddenly seems better than where you are today. See, that's what depression will do. Depression will say everything is better than where you are right now. 
The enemy will get your thinking and it all starts in the mind. If he can defeat you here, he can defeat you everywhere else. Which brings me to number two. Depression affects the way you feel. It affects the way you feel. Look at the verse three here. It says, my tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? That's a pretty strong statement. My tears have been my food all day long. That's what David's saying. He said, I... All I know is sorrow. All I know is this hurt. All I know is this pain. I don't want to eat. I don't want to sleep. I don't want to see your face. No, I don't want to go to the ball game. You don't want to go to the ball game. No, I want to stay home. I'll watch it at home by myself. Because that's the way you feel. You get to work on the next morning. Somebody says, are you okay? You say, no, I'm not. You want to talk about it? No, I don't. (laughs) Because that's the way I feel. Come on. You know what I'm talking about. It's the way you feel. You can't help it. You don't know why you're snapping at people. You don't know why your face is contorted and your neck is spinning around 360 degrees. You don't know why. It's just the way you feel. Because the enemy is trying to rob you of life. Number three, here's the next part. Depression affects the way you act. Depression affects the way you act. Here's what David says. He says, why, my soul, are you so downcast? Why so disturbed within me? It will affect the way you act. David's sitting around and saying, what is wrong with you? You ever looked in the mirror and just looked at yourself and thought, you're pathetic. (laughs) You know, you, you ever just looked at yourself and said, you don't look right. Your hair's dumb. Your clothes are dumb. You know, you just go through the, I don't like this. I don't like this. I don't like this. Why do I act this way? Why do I do this? Why do I do all of these? You get in this moment where no matter what you do, you don't know why you act the way you do. Why am I not happy? Everything around me is not as, not as bad. Maybe you can see it clearly, but you can't feel it. Maybe you know the truth. Maybe you know that you're blessed. Maybe you look at your family and say, man, God, you've blessed me with so much. So, God, why do I still feel this way? You can't handle. You can't control. You can't change the way you feel. And the reason is, is because it was a process. It began in the mind. It just began something that you began to think all the way down to the way you act. You begin to think it so you believe it. Feel it in your heart. Anybody ever said that? I just feel it in my heart. My heart said this. Well, the Bible says that your heart is deceitful above all things. If you're saying this morning that I'm following my heart, well, you need to stop following your heart, and you need to follow the Holy Spirit and what Jesus is saying because your heart will lead you wrong. Here's what I'm telling you this morning. There's a real enemy, and he wants to destroy your life. And there's not one person in here this morning that the devil would like nothing more than to get a hold of your mind, to get a hold of your heart, make you feel a certain way, so that you begin to act a certain way. You know one of the biggest number one signs this morning that you're dealing with depression in your life, that it's starting, is that you begin to separate yourself. Things that you used to love to do, suddenly you don't want to do it anymore. Used to, when when you love to to serve people and used to love to be with God's people and and used to love to hang out at small group or used to love to do all these things and suddenly you're withdrawing and you start to disappear, that's the number one sign that something's going on in somebody's life. The number one sign is that you begin to disappear. See, we always say it every week at Cultivate Church, we really believe that every person matters. Nobody's a face in the crowd. We're just a family here. We love each other. We hang out. We do real life together. We're not fake here. We're just in it together. But as soon as one of the family members stops showing up to the family functions, you know something's wrong. You know, you know that God is speaking to them and the enemy's trying to take them. Because that's the number one sign that something is going on. Because you think it, you feel it, and then you begin to act on it. But this morning, the great news is, is that God doesn't keep us there. I want you to flip your outline over and I want to give you three ways that I believe that God wants to help us to get out of this depression. To get unstuck in our lives. There's three things that you need this morning. Here's number one. Here's what I want to give you. You need a change of mind. You need a change of mind. Listen to what the Bible says. This is a 
really cool verse of scripture, cool passage. Lamentations three nineteen through 23 says this. It says, I remember my affliction and my wondering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. My soul is downcast within me. Here's what the writer's saying. I, I remember the days. I, I remember that feeling. I, I remember that darkness, the cloud of depression in my life. But check this out. Verse 21. He says, yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. In my, in my notes, here's what I did. I, I underlined the word this because it was important. He said, now this. That was the changer. And then he said, now I have hope. And I underlined hope. So I said, okay, what is the this to get to the hope? And then he gives us verse 22. He says, because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Is that not awesome? The writer says, I remember back what it felt like. I remember those feelings, but, but because of this, I have hope. What is this? It's the Lord's great love. Underline it because it's for you this morning. It's because of the Lord's great love. That's why he had hope. It's because of the Lord's compassions that never fail. God is compassionate towards you. That's why you have hope. It's because they are new every single morning. That's why you have hope. See, it's a process. It's every day, getting unstuck. You may feel one way today. You may feel like you're climbing the mountain, and then you start all over again tomorrow. Tomorrow morning, Monday's coming, but guess what? You have hope because the Lord's mercies are new, and his compassion, the love, is new every single morning. When you wake up, and that depression is ready to tackle you and chain you to that bed, the Lord is there with a brand new, fresh start to your day. You need a change of mind. Begin to change your thinking. You know, really, the mind is powerful. You know, if you ever thought to, to, to trick your mind into something, you ever tried to learn to like something and you just told yourself, I'm going to like this. I'm going to eat this green thing and it's going to be good. I'm going to dip it in ketchup and it's going to be good. You know, you, you get yourself to trick it. It's kind of like saying this, there's only really one good thing about depression. I could say this, the only one good thing I could find in depression was that I never had to make my bed. You never have to make your bed because you're always in the bed. You know what I'm saying? It's all in how you look at it. It could be a negative thing, I'm always in the bed, or it could be, I don't even have to make it, I'm already here. You know, it's just how your mind begins to focus things. You need to retrain your mind. You need to let the Lord help you renew your mind. The Bible says that when we say yes to Jesus, all things become new. The old is gone, and he makes us brand new creations. That's the only way it's going to That's the only way it's going to work. See, I can't do it for you. The self-help book can't do it for you. No great preacher can do it for you. It's Jesus who will change and renew your mind. So you've been trying to focus. You've got the calendar. You've got the kittens on the refrigerator. I mean, you know, you've got the whole deal that makes you smile with a great inspirational quote. You know what I mean? But it's only Jesus that changes your mind. You need a new frame of mind. Number two, real quick, you need to change your scenery. You need to change your scenery. The Bible says two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If one of them falls down, one can help the other up. But pity, I underlined that, pity. I like pity when I'm down. Somebody pity me. Pity anyone who falls and has no one to help them up. If two lie down together, they'll keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Hear me summarize that for you. Stop being alone. The more you spend time alone in your depression, the more you're giving depression the ability to win. Surround yourself with people. Surround yourself with people. On the night when Jesus was crucified, remember I mentioned he was praying? Remember, remember what I said he did? He took people with him. In his deepest, darkest moment, he was surrounded by the people who were closest with him. You need to surround yourself with people. That's why we do small groups at Cultivate Church, so that you can surround yourself with people. It's not just to have something to do. It's so that you can surround yourself with people. I can't do life on my own, and you can't either. God didn't design us that way. We need each other. Find yourself a small group. Scripture says, pity the man who falls and has no one to help him up. 
pity the person at Cultivate Church who falls and has not a small group. That's, that's the Brandon Matthews version, okay? Find yourself a small group. Just last weekend, a couple of guys on our worship team lead a small group for, for, for guys. Just a place to go, guys to get together, open up their lives. I mean, it's, it's, it's really an incredible small group. Uh, one, of, one of the guys in our church lives 45 to an, uh, to minutes to an hour away on a Friday night. He called. He said, hey, guys. He said, I'm struggling with some things in my life. He said, can we get together? They all said, absolutely, we'll be there. It wasn't small group night. It was an extra night. They said, we'll be there. These guys get together. This guy drives an hour just to say, hey, I need some help in my life. And you know what? That's what small group is about. Pity the man who didn't have somebody to call and say, I'm in the midst of a struggle and I need somebody right now and have no one. But thank God that when you are surround yourself with people, when you can't hold yourself up, they will lift you up. That's the purpose in a small group. So get connected. Get a, a directory at Information Central. Look online. Find yourself a small group this week. And now, finally, the last one I'll give you, number three, you need a change of direction. You need a change of direction. Feed the hungry, help those in trouble. Then your light will shine out from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. One of my favorite scriptures in the world. It makes no sense. So you need a change of direction. Here's what, here, listen to this. Here, here's, here's what's so crazy. Depression looks inward, okay? De depression looks inward, but hope looks outward. See, depression makes you look here, but hope makes you look here. When you're depressed, you don't care about everybody else. I'm sorry your head hurts, but I hate life, okay? You don't care about everybody else. But listen to what the scripture says. It makes no sense. It says, feed the hungry, help those who are in trouble. Then your light will shine from the darkness, and the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. To me, it makes no sense. But to Jesus, he knows more than we know, thankfully, right? He says when you start investing your life in others, when you stop looking inward and you begin to look outward, it don't just change their life. It changes yours. To get out of your junk, you need to get involved in somebody else's junk. I wrote this down. I said the best way to find your purpose is to lose yourself in others. The best way to find your purpose is to lose yourself in somebody else. You need to get past your stuff. Listen, that's why, we, that's why we serve at Cultivate Church. That's why we say the dream team is where you need to be. I mean, the worship team was packed this morning. It's full of people. There's people not even on the team. I mean, it's, it's crazy. We can't fit people up here. But if you're sitting out there and your heart's to serve and to play, and there's no reason you're not serving, you're not playing. Don't walk in the place and say, well, it looks like everything's covered. I don't have a place for me. Well, we'll push somebody out of the way, okay? Listen, at, at, at 11 o'clock this morning, this place is going to be full. And I love you early birds, okay? Because there's no room for you at 11 o'clock, okay? But here's the deal. I'll give somebody my seat, and I'll sit in the floor. I'll stand in the back. You know why? Because somebody needs to meet Jesus. Because I want to serve and give my life away because it changes me. Because it changes me. There's people serving all around. There's people parking cars, uh, you know, taking care of babies, fixing coffee. I mean, you name it around here. This don't just happen. It takes people to make it happen. And you know what happens every week? Their lives are changed because they got a change of direction. They're not looking inward about me. They're looking outward. This morning, here's what God wants to do. He wants to get you unstuck, give you a change of direction. I want to ask you to bow your head, close your eyes. If you're our guest today, hey, don't worry, nothing funny or weird. I'm just going to pray for you this morning. But here's what I would say. If you want to get unstuck, you want God to, to revolutionize and change your life, you need to meet Jesus first. And if Jesus isn't number one in your life, I want to give you a chance. The worship team's coming. They're just going to play something soft. Again, nobody's coming to get you, but I want to know this morning, if you're here and you don't have that personal relationship with Jesus, it's the greatest decision you'll ever make. Online, if you're wherever you are, you need to make Jesus the first in your life. That's where it all begins. And the only thing I'd ask you to do this morning, if that's you and you want to make that decision, I just want you to slip your hand up just where you are. Just throw it up so I can see it just really quick. That's all you got to do just to respond. That's awesome. Come on, on the internet, come on, right where you are. Don't let the enemy take your time. I'm going to lead you guys in a prayer in a moment. And for everybody else, you know if you're here and you've been struggling with these feelings. This morning, I, I want to pray that God would just begin to rescue you, lift you out of that ditch, and, 
give you hope in your life. Jesus, this morning, over every person who said, I want to make you number one. Father, I pray today that you just forgive us of our sins. We've done life alone, on our own, our own way. We can't do it anymore without you. Jesus, thank you for loving me, for dying on the cross. Today, Father, you have my life. In Jesus, I belong to you. And over every other individual who's struggling this morning with anxiety, with depression, with worry, with fear, with stress, with suicidal thoughts, Father, this morning I just pray that we begin the process of being unstuck today. Father, just begin to change our minds. Change the scenery of which we're around. Father, change our direction. Today we need you, Jesus, like never before. And we're going to celebrate your goodness and life change that begins today. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Cultivate Church, can we celebrate the goodness of Jesus today? Come on.